And if we could uh, just pause, I could have your attention. Again, special welcome to this beautiful evening uh, where Kendrick Seminary is proud to have Father Jim Swetnam with us this evening on this uh, beautiful Feast of St. Francis of Assisi. Let's pause for a few seconds of silence to call to mind the Blessed Trinity's presence here among us and very eager to bless us. Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, we open our hearts to you. We turn towards you to receive your blessing. Blessings that throw, flow through Father Swetnam this evening and through our communion with you. Thank you for the gift of faith that you pour into our hearts through your Holy Spirit, strengthening that image of Jesus within us. Thank you for the church, your mystical body. Strengthen us this evening through the intercession of St. Francis. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and ever shall be, world without end. Amen. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. I'm going to give a very brief, informal uh, introduction to Father Swetnam and Father Soto, who uh, studied under and with Father Swetnam will give a more formal introduction. It's with really immense gratitude that, as a Jesuit brother, I introduce uh, Father Swetnam to you this evening. I thought of uh, Blessed John Paul II's emphasis from time to time in his writings and speeches about uh, what he called the radiation of fatherhood. And I was, when I was thinking of introducing Father Swetnam, I couldn't help but actually think of that. And it was also brought to uh, all those phrases that we read in documents over and over again. Um, in the flesh, in Father Swetnam's flesh, there would be this communion, communion of men and women uh, in the Holy Spirit, in the heart of Jesus. So with us this, this evening is a man who radiates fatherhood and the Holy Spirit in practical and beautiful ways. And, and invites us, or God invites us through him tonight and to taste this communion of love. I'll tell you a story. I've only had the privilege of having dinner uh, and lunch with Father Swetnam a few times down at Jesuit Hall, new, relatively new to the St. Louis area as I am. But I didn't have to meet him for more than a few minutes or a few meals to taste this communion and this radiation of fatherhood. As the seminarians uh, sold this afternoon in an informal <coughs> question and answer periods and time of story, uh, they experienced uh, Father Swetnam's straightforwardness and his gentleness and his joy in the Holy Spirit. That's what I experienced at those uh, few lunches and suppers as I was checked out as whether or not I agreed with Humane Vitae, which I, of course, very much do. But um, I found in... <laughs> I found in Father Swetnam uh, this rare blend of truth and charity, uh, where he would be with someone who was a dissenter with the same kind of charity as he was with me, a fellow believer in Humane Vitae. There is a real personalism in Father Swetnam's being with us tonight, even though he served most of his life uh, the international community in Rome. Uh, but he, uh, Father Swetnam, had served the Carmelite Sisters last summer that serve us in the seminary mission. He served them on, as a retreat director, and he served the Alma Mercy Sisters, uh, who were an important part also of uh, the seminary mission uh, by giving the 30-day retreat at a, a wonderful, beautiful island out in the northwest in Puget Sound uh, for many summers now, the gift of the spiritual exercises. And with uh, one simple comment before I turn this over to Father Soto, for this more formal introduction, uh, Father Swetnam, or Jim, as a brother, uh, after knowing you for a short time, as the seminarians would understand from this afternoon's conference, uh, I want to be counted in that number of people who uh, want a desire to grow older through the attractiveness that shines through you, uh, through the faithful heart of Christ that shines through you, radiation of the Father. 
in a communion in the Holy Spirit. It's a privilege to welcome you and to receive tonight to the glory of God through the heart of Father Jim Swetnam. pleasure for me to be here tonight to introduce Father Jane Septon to our Kenrick <coughs> lecture because Father Swetnam for me is El Maestro, the Master. And I was very honored when I was asked to introduce him. Father Swetnam has, as you can see from his uh, curriculum there in, the, in your program, he has spent most of his life at the Publicum in Rome, 50 years, um, of which he taught Greek to all the Catholic scholars and non-Catholics as well who study there, uh, the Biblical language of Greek. He is the author of a great grammar. We were talking this on the table. His grammar is the best detailed and explained uh, grammar written in English about the Koine Greek of the New Testament. I was privileged to study it under him. I was privileged to bring that grammar to Henry and teach our own Deacon Charlie Sampson, who passed and this exam, he tested out and passed the exam, his entrance exam to the Wilbacom using his grammar. So I was very pleased to see that it was used and helped me and is helping our men here at Henry. He has done a great deal of work in his specialty, which is the letter to the Hebrews. Um, he owns a doctorate from Oxford University in England. He has a great expertise in the classics. Someone who is very eloquent, but at the same time, a gentleman. I have never heard Father Swetnam say anything unkind of anybody. His pedagogy, his teaching was always, and still is, of a true gentleman wanting the students to learn the subject and wanting us to learn to use the tools that are at our disposal to learn how to interpret correctly the Word of God according to the teachings of the Church. What I admire of Father Sermon the most is his balance between academics and fidelity to the magisterium, how well he kept those two things together and has proven to be a great scholar, but at the same time a great son of the church. And this is why we're trying to still here at Kendrick, so we're pleased to have him. Tonight he is going to share with us his experience uh, on Catholicism, a share adventure is his title. And I am looking forward to listening to him once more, learning from his depth, from his knowledge, but at the same time from his witness. So without any other introduction, I would like to introduce to you El Maestro. As I look on those distinguished people who are my predecessors in this uh, very honored position of giving the Kenrick Lecture, <clears throat> so all these very famous names and very capable people, the only thing I can think of is that so the selection committee was intent on establishing a benign interpretation of guilt by association. <laughs> but this gives me a good chance to publicly thank so many people who gave me a wonderful education. Beginning with the Dominican Sisters of Spark Hill, New York at Holy Redeemer Grade School in the Goodlyburg of Webster Groves. I'm sure you 
people here in Shrewsbury have heard of Webster Groves. <laughs> and uh, from there I went to St. Louis U High and survived. <laughs> and from then on I was in the hands of the Society of Jesus and the Society of Jesus gave me a superb education. <clears throat> and I'm very grateful and uh, for the ability to, to the possibility of thanking them uh, publicly, all these wonderful people in so many different places for what they did for me. <clears throat> About 50 years ago, when Pope John was still Pope, John the 23rd, I was on a train in northwestern Italy, and the train stopped at the city of Genoa. And into the compartment, which had been empty, came a mother and a little eight-year-old girl. Well, I asked the mother if I could uh, speak to the little girl, which I, she gave me permission, and I proceeded to talk to the little girl. And we had a very interesting conversation. But I saw that her face became more and more puzzled. So I knew what her problem was. She couldn't tell where I was from. So in Italy, you could often tell where people were from by the way they pronounce Italian. So I said, am I from Rome? No, you're not from Rome. Am I from Florence, where the Italian language got to, was born? Oh, no, you're not from Florence. Am I from Genoa here? No, you're not from Genoa. So I thought of Pope John XXIII's hometown of Bergamo, where they speak a, in very difficult dialect, so difficult that unless you're born and raised there, even though you're Italian, you can't understand what people are saying. So I said, am I from Bergamo? No, you're not from Bergamo, because up there they speak Italian even worse than you do. <laughs> so whenever you try to learn a foreign language, try to speak to children. <laughs> they, they give you the unvarnished truth. Well, I hope I speak the dialect uh, which we were raised to speak in the goodly burg of Webster Groves, but you people here in Shrewsbury can understand us when we speak English. <laughs> Fifty years ago this month, over 2,000 Catholic bishops from all over the world assembled in Rome for the first session of the 21st Ecumenical Council of the Roman Catholic Church, usually re referred to as Vatican II. The ideas contained in the text of Vatican II have played a significant role in the aftermath of the closure of the council in, uh, in the aftermath of the closure of the council in 1965, both within and without the church. The reception of the ideas, that is the texts of Vatican II by Catholics, has not been uniform. There are differences about the council, some it seems to me legitimate, legitimate, some quite illegitimate. From my contact in Rome with the bishops of the council, during all four years in which the council was in session, admittedly uh, my contact was rather superficial, but I was there within a, a, a mile or so of the council in St. Peter's. And during the four sessions, I never had the impression that the council fathers thought that what they were deciding was a radical break with the past. A radical development, even a radical change, if you will, yes, but not a radical break. The bishops, and certainly Pope John XXIII and Pope Paul VI, looked on the pre-conciliar church and the post-conciliar church as one and the same. In order to reach a balanced understanding of what the text of Vatican II uh, means, one must have the what the text of Vatican II mean, one must have a balanced hermeneutics. Hermeneutics is the art of interpreting written texts. It involves basically the proper self-awareness of an objective truth to be known and of the proper self-awareness 
of the one trying to know it. In the field of scripture studies, hermeneutics plays an important part, for it enables the interpreter to have a proper introspective awareness of what he is about. Of course, in the case of scripture, uh, it, it's a text which is the object of faith, and any object of faith, uh, there are some other steps that come in, but they basically depend on <clears throat> the self-awareness of the person. <clears throat> and of course, scripture is not the only text where hermeneutics is crucial. The Constitution of the United States is also a text where the interpretation, where the interpreter must have a proper introspective self-awareness. The text of Vatican II must be approached as an objective truth to be interpreted with the proper introspective self-awareness. And by extension, any collection of phenomena which need interpretation can legitimately be subject to hermeneutics in a broad sense. For example, the whole post-conciliar scene in the Catholic Church needs a proper hermeneutics for its interpretation. One insightful approach to hermeneutics is that of the French philosopher Paul Ricoeur. The developed, uh, he developed a thought-provoking hermeneutics which he called the hermeneutics of suspicion. The hermeneutics of suspicion in which the need for a balanced self-awareness as regards objective truth and the subjective knower is skillfully outlined. But as sometimes happens in fields of human endeavor, a balanced self-awareness is quite difficult to achieve <clears throat> and a hermeneutics of suspicion can run amok even to the point of a deliberate will to disbelieve objective evidence because of subjective perspective. Witness, for example, the first chapter of Mary Eberstadt's masterly book, masterful book, Adam and Eve After the Pill. In this book, uh, Introduction, she compares the deliberate refusal by many persons in the United States today to refuse to recognize the tragic effects of the sexual revolution in the United States to the refusal, she compares this refusal, to the refusal of some people to recognize the evils of the Soviet Union. Perhaps one would not be far wrong to characterize such aberration as a refusal to give credence to the obvious, a sort of naysaying as addiction. One astute observer has labeled such an unbalanced form of hermeneutics of suspicion in the extended sense as the reduction of wonder to banality. The reduction of wonder to banality. That's genius. G.K. Chesterton, the English convert of a century ago, ago would have understood. For him, a balanced introspective self-awareness of the objective phenomena of his life was always at fever pitch. He delighted in rain because it was wet. He delighted in children because they were themselves. And he delighted in the Eucharist because it was God with us. Chesterton lived constantly in a world of wonders which were never banal, be they natural or supernatural. With all, this, all of this all too brief in presentation of the need for a balanced hermeneutics of suspicion in interpreting texts, let us consider briefly this evening the pastoral constitution on the church in the modern world. The church in the modern world, known by its Latin name of Gaudium et Spes, joy and hope. Gaudium et Spes was approved by Paul VI on December the 7th, 1965. It is important to note at the outset 
that it is addressed not only to Catholics in particular and all Christians in general, but to the entire world. The Council desires to explain to everyone how it conceives the presence and function of the Church in the world of today. Paragraph 2. But even if the document is addressed to the entire world, it is clear that the primary responsibility for explaining it belongs to Catholics, for it is their church which is being explained, and they are the ones who are its members. If the members do not have a balanced view of what the document says, who can expect non-Catholics to have one? Chapter 1 of Gaudi Mespez is about the dignity of the human person. The dignity of the human person is a basic principle in Catholic thinking and in Catholic living. The concept person underlies all of the church's history. The first ecumenical councils are a history of the church's coming to an ever greater introspective awareness of what it objectively means to be a person. Nicaea I, Constantinople I, Ephesus, Chalcedon, the first four ecumenical councils, crucial councils in the whole history of the church. The Council of Chalcedon in 451 constituted the climax of this initial view of the person. For it was in this council that Christ was defined as one person with two natures. In technical terms, what the Council Fathers solemnly approved was the doctrine of the hypostatic union. Christ was a divine person with two natures, one divine, the other human. This insight about the divine person who is Christ and the concomitant insights about the divine person who is the Father and the divine person who is the Holy Spirit constitute, constitute the dogmatic foundation of the orthodox Christian view of God, that he is three in one. And these insights eventually led to a deeper insight into the exceptional character of the human person, a being created in God's image. Gaudium et Spes has a long discussion of this in section paragraph 12. A, per, a, a being who knows and wills, paragraphs 15 and 17, whose dignity must always be respected, and who, like the Christian God, lives in a community of persons. Paragraphs 12, 23, 25. Chesterton has put it well. To us Trinitarians, if I may uh, say it with reverence, for us Trinitarians, to us God himself is a society. But this insistence of the church on the unique status of the human person, now known in contemporary language as human exceptionalism, as the current language has it, along with other pos any positions taken by the church in the face of the challenges to orthodox Christian faith and morals, must be accompanied by a sane hermeneutics of suspicion if it is to be interpreted in all its depth. And here Chesterton, the convert to Catholicism, once more comes to our assistance with a key insight, the key insight necessary to make the hermeneutics of suspicion maintain its balance for a Catholic, no matter what the challenge. What is this key insight? The romance of orthodoxy. The romance of orthodoxy. Quotation. This is the thrilling romance of orthodoxy. There never was anything so perilous or so exciting as orthodoxy. The Orthodox Church, and of course he means the Catholic Church, 
as at his believing in the tradition of the apostles, he doesn't mean the Eastern Church, the Orthodox Church in that sense, though the Orthodox Church never took the same course or accepted the conventions, the Orthodox Church was never respectable. It is always simple to fall. There are an infinity of angles at which one falls, only one at which one stands. To have fallen into any one of the fads from Gnosticism to Christian science would indeed have been obvious and tame, but to have avoided them all has been one whirling adventure. And in my vision, the heavenly chariot flies thundering through the ages, the dull heresies sprawling and prostrate, the wild truth reeling but erect. That's genuine Chesterton. <laughs> I propose to use Chesterton's criterion of Catholic orthodoxy to help achieve a, achieve a balanced self-awareness as regards principles set forth in Gaudi et Spes to new problems confronting the church in the contemporary world, problems which Gaudi et Spes had not foreseen or not taken an explicit stand on. So I'm going from Gaudi et Spes and the principles which they enunciate there and apply them to three examples of challenges to the thinking of the church and of the Western civilization in the contemporary world. Take, for example, the proposal made by some today that non-human animals are persons. You think this is silly? You know that in the constitutions, the constitution of Switzerland, it says that plants must be respected. This is not simply, this is not simply uh, very quaint ideas. This is naturalism, pushing, pushing, pushing against the Christian view of life by nibbles here and there. The, per pers the pers per personhood of animals is not, is not just a flight of fancy, and you'll have to look only at recent books by a certain Gary L. Fransoni, and you can see this. The positions of the Princeton professor Peter Singer also merit examination in this regard. If animals are person-like, well, humans, are just animal-like. So if parents don't want to have their children, give them 30 days to the side. If they don't like it, like the child, let it die of exposure. This is the new world we're coming to. To see a balanced evaluation in the light of the Catholic teaching on the human person, I recommend consulting works by Wesley J. Smith, who until last week wrote for First Things and now writes for National Review Online. Uh, Wesley J. Smith is abreast not only of this problem, but also of other aspects of the much larger question of human exceptionalism. All his presentations are made on the basis of an orthodox Catholic view of the human person. He represents continuity. Fransoni and Singer represent a break between the Catholic tradition of orthodoxy and what they think the human person means. An instance in which Gaudium et Spes outlined principles of Catholic orthodoxy and was aware of a problem but without attempting the key decision necessary to resolve it was the vexed question of artificial contraception. In its section, Fostering the Nobility of Marriage and the Family, paragraphs 47 to 52, the Council reiterated the Orthodox Catholic view of the dignity of married life and the centrality of the family in human society. The application of this view 
to the concrete problem of the use of the pill and other artificial means of contraception came three years after the close of the council in the form of Humane Vitae, one of the most controversial documents of the modern papacy. At the time of its publication, Humane Vitae was received, what shall I say, with polite disdain by many, if not most, Catholics here in the United States. It was ridiculed by many Christians, even though it simply applied the orthodoxy of previous decisions within the Catholic Church, decisions which had been uniformly shared by other non-Catholic Christians as well. It can safely be said that the majority of Catholics in the United States today do not seem to follow the teaching of Humane Vitae. But it can also be safely said that time has arguably vindicated the prophecies of Humane Vitae of disaster in matters regarding marriage and the family as the final chapter of, Mar of Mary Everstadt's Adam and Eve after the pill indicate convincingly. If you haven't read this book, Adam and Eve After the Pill by Mary Eberstadt, I strongly recommend it um, as a strong dose of Orthodox Catholic teaching in regard to uh, Humane Vitae, supported by all kinds of evidence by sociologists, economists, non-Catholic sociologists, non-Catholic uh, economists, who are honest people and are not afraid to recognize the truth when they see it. The recent maneuvers involving the use of artificial contraception by the present administration <clears throat> of the federal government in Washington <coughs> to divide Catholics and help facilitate the imposition of the government's own norms on Catholics as regards artificial contra contraception have succeeded remarkably well. But apart from the central question of freedom of religious practice which they have raised, they have also unintentionally brought the whole question of artificial contraception onto the national scene in a way that has never happened in this country. And all the resulting discussion is by no means negative. One has only to reflect on the fact that a newspaper like the Washington Post deems it worthwhile to publish articles by Ashley McGuire, for example, and to appreciate the positive new element which has been introduced into the secular discussion on a national scale by Catholics who are convinced of the truth of Humane Vitae and live it. But of course, the dean of Catholic authorities on an orthodox interpretation of Humane Vitae remains Janet Smith of Sacred Heart uh, Seminary in Detroit. She is undoubtedly the spokesman for the Catholic Church in this country, country on Humane Vitae. Gaudi Metzpez also has much to say about culture and about the rightful distinction between the order orders of knowledge involving faith and reason. Man has the right to seek truth according to the norms proper to each of these two domains, faith and reason. These are favorite themes of our present Holy Father, uh, Benedict XVI. And by the way, you and I should constantly thank Almighty God for having <clears throat> um, a pope with the intellectual acumen of Benedict the Sixteenth. So the, um, we have the right to seek truth according to the norms proper to faith and the norms proper to reason, and the consequent use of man's free will to seek what is good. In terms of classical Thomism, <clears throat> the intellect is the form of the will giving it direction and purpose. This is the basis for the primacy of reason in the orthodox Catholic view of the primacy of knowledge as the basis for wisdom and man's quest for what is good. 
By the intellect, a person arrives at what is true, and by the will, the person chooses the truth as a good. But this primacy of reason in human affairs is being challenged by another view, which holds for the primacy of choice, that is, the will. That is to say, freedom means that our choices are what determine what makes the truth of our lives, rather than truth determining our choices. So this new view just reverses the classic Catholic view, orthodox view. The new view makes will primary. So will is what determines the truth of our lives, not uh, the intellect. The will is what sets the parameters of human choice, not the intellect. According to this contemporary view, the more choices differ among themselves, the better. For in this way, the full range of the human spirit becomes manifest and letting the search for the knowledge of objective truth serve as the basis for our personal choice, choices is outmoded. That belongs to a previous outmoded age. I hope a person who follows this view of the primacy of will over truth uh, is not driving an automobile when I come to an intersection. <laughs> James Kalb is the Catholic thinker who has pioneered an orthodox Catholic response to this aberrant way of looking at a crucial aspect of contemporary culture. It should be noted that all of the thinkers cited above who are fending off new challenges to Catholic teaching are members of the laity. They are living out what Vatican II called for in the decree on the apostolate of the laity, apostolicam actualitatem, apostolic activity. <clears throat> to all of the three challenges to the traditional teaching of the church, the norm of orthodoxy argues in favor of the exceptional nature of the human person as opposed to non-human animals, in favor of the acceptance of humane vitae by Catholics and not Catholics alike, and to favor, <clears throat> in favor of the truth of human lives as being based on intellect and not on will. <clears throat> or that is to say, on objective truth. Other examples could be adduced, but the three challenges outlined above are of paramount importance. Widespread acceptance of any of the contentions embedded in the, the above three challenges to the established wisdom of contemporary culture could result in a change in the way which humans live, which would be unimaginable. In the case of sexual mores and family life, that radical change has already taken place in the United States to no small extent. And it's being documented by, documented by sociologists. The parting of America by Charles Murray for example, documents how the lower spectrum of American culture is ruled now by a far advanced disintegration of family life. Among Afro-Americans, the rate of illegitimate births is two-thirds, 66 percent. Even the New York Times gulped when it saw that. But the above account for the role of orthodoxy as an arm for achieving proper self-awareness as part of a balanced hermeneutics of suspicion is not really sufficient to understand what Catholic orthodoxy really is, as Chesterton himself would be the first to admit. For he himself has given us the key to the fuller understanding of Catholic orthodoxy. In his account of orthodoxy given above, he says that for the church to have avoided all the myriad fads through which the church has passed has been one whirling adventure. Adventure. Adventure is the key word. Elsewhere, Chesterton has written in his book, Orthodoxy, that 
man must have just enough faith in himself to have adventures and just enough doubt of himself to enjoy them. <laughs> man must have enough, just enough faith in himself to have adventures and just enough doubt of himself to enjoy them. I understand this in the sense that when faced with the possibility of an adventure, a Christian must trust in the gifts God has given him. <coughs> Pardon me. But then must at the same time realize that any real adventure depends on God's providential care to be brought to, its, to a successful completion. And if this is true of the adventures of any one Christian, it is above all true of the adventure of the church of which we are all, are all members. Hence, the title of this lecture, Catholicism as Shared Adventure. For all Catholics have a right and a duty to share in the adventure of the church and of the church's avoidance of fads through the guidance of the principle of orthodoxy. And the principle of orthodoxy is only the extended manifestation of the guidance of divine providence from without and the Holy Spirit from within. If we Catholics are to enjoy the adventure we are participating in, we must mistrust ourselves if we are going to trust in the God who will see us safely to our goal. We must have enough trust in ourselves to accept adventure and enough mistrust in ourselves to enjoy it. J.K. Chesterton ends his book, Orthodoxy, with praise for the romance of orthodoxy. The pursuit of orthodoxy and the living of orthodoxy has been for me personally a wonderful challenge and a wonderful aid in the mistrust of myself necessary for the supreme adventure of life. The church in this country and elsewhere, if I not be not mistaken, faces serious opposition, perhaps even overt persecution in the not too distant future. I recommend the romance of orthodoxy as a helpful imaginative stance in the facing of this future. Perhaps one other instance where orthodoxy can be a safe guide in confronting a contemporary fad can be found in these words of Chesterton. If we wish to pull down the prosperous oppressor, we cannot do it with the new doctrine of human perfectibility. We can do it with the old doctrine of original sin. That man has insight. In his book, Orthodoxy, Chesterton takes the spiritually curious reader on an intellectual quest. While looking for the meaning of life, Chesterton finds that Christian orthodoxy uniquely fulfills his needs. This orthodoxy is the truth revealed in Christianity. Chesterton likens this discovery to a man armed with the security that security that only Christian orthodoxy can give, setting off from the south coast of England. He journeys at sea for many days, only to arrive at Brighton, the point of his native land from which he had originally left. Such a man, now outfitted with the more profound awareness of Christian orthodoxy, an awareness enriched by adventure at sea, would see orthodoxy tied up with the place he grew up in with newly appreciative eyes. And as a result, his native place to him is now the same, same orthodox place he left, only more so. And his orthodoxy has made it possible for him to see anew the basic continuity of his life, the basic reason for why he remains the person he is. Fifty years ago this month, the bark of Peter began an adventure at sea. Armed with the orthodoxy of 1900 years, it set sail on the uncharted waters of the contemporary world. 
In just this way, the bark of Peter had set sail so many times in the past on the uncharted waters of contemporary worlds. And now, 50 years later, this bark of Peter is returning to a strange land which is also wonderfully familiar. The bark of Peter is as orthodox as ever, but the past 50 years have deepened this orthodoxy so that it now has a more profound sense of who the bark of Peter really is. The same bark of Peter it always has been, but only more so. You see, the bark of P Peter was faced with the possibility of an adventure, and as usual, the bark has had enough trust in itself to accept the adventure and enough mistrust of itself to enjoy it. Sixty-seven years ago, last August, a 17-year-old boy from the goodly burg of Webster Groves entered the Jesuit division at Florissant, Missouri. This young man came well equipped with the basic tools of a good education, thanks to Holy Redeemer Grade School and St. Louis University High School. In particular, he came with a knowledge and love of G.K. Chesterton's book, Orthodoxy, which a discerning senior English teacher had put into his hands when he was 16 years old. In the intervening 67 years, the 17-year-old boy has been in a great variety of places and has met a great variety of people and has had a great variety of experiences. And now he finds himself back where he started. Despite the great variety he has experienced, he is the same person he was when he entered the Jesuit novitiate, but only more so. For he learned even before he departed the goodly burg of Webster Groves that to remain always the same in life as he faced constant variety and change, he must have orthodoxy as his guide. Looking back, he can now say that at the age of 17, he was faced with the possibility of an adventure. With God's help, he had enough trust in himself to accept this adventure and enough mis <clears throat> mistrust of himself to enjoy it. Thank you.